tonight as we prepare ourselves to spend time in God's presence, we just want to read a little portion of the word. We've been touching in a series on the basics of prayer. And as we enter into God's presence tonight, and enjoy His presence, we have to consider some more areas on the basics of prayer. So let's go to God in prayer as we consider His Word and meditate on His Word. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Let Your living Word strengthen us. Let Your living Word change and transform our lives. Let your word of life and your word of light be powerfully upon us, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, that you continue, Lord, to transform us as we seek your presence. So speak, O oh Lord, into our hearts and into our lives and let your will be done tonight and through the whole morning as we wait upon you. For your word says that those who wait upon you shall indeed rise up like the eagles. They shall run and they shall not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. Because it's your strength in us as an eagle as we wait upon you. Let your light and your glory shine upon us tonight. And we welcome you. We welcome your light. We welcome your spirit. We welcome your presence. We ask that once again you glorify Jesus in our midst. Let your word be like a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Let your word be like a fire in our bones, as it was in Jeremiah's time. Let your word be like a hammer and a mighty stone that crush everything under its power, as the mighty cornerstone crush every kingdom. And became the kingdom of God. We thank you Father. And we proclaim your kingdom. In this place. In our lives. In this nation. And throughout the world. We continue to proclaim. The kingdom of God. Has come. So as we consider your word tonight. Establish. Your word in our lives that we can pray by the power of your spirit and by the power of your word in us. Let your word of faith be established in us, Lord. And we love you and glorify you. And ask that your glory abide in us in a greater measure as we follow hard after you. Thank you, Father. We covenant to give you all the glory, worship, and honor for all that you do. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, it. Amen. Tonight, as we consider another point on the basics of prayer, we want to consider what I call the world of thoughts. There is the world that is outside us and around us and about us. But there is another world by which we perceive and see all things within ourselves. And that is the world of thoughts that surround us. And much as we don't realize it, but the world of thoughts that we all live in, in our individual bubble of thoughts that arise, and tonight when we spend hours in the presence of God, thoughts will flow through our lives. And more important, 
than the external world. Because the external world is being changed by this internal world of thoughts. There's an ex external physical world and an internal world that we live in. And so as we spend time with God's presence tonight, we will be in a world of thoughts. And as long as we exist, as long as we live, we dwell in this world of thoughts that is within us. Now the world of thoughts that we all live individually are different. You have around you a series of thoughts and a flow of different variation of thoughts from the person next to you. We all have our thoughts. We all have our impressions. And everything is flowing in a, in a bubble of our own world, of our thoughts. And as we yield to those thoughts, as we function in those thoughts, we create our own life. We create our own destiny. And it's this world of thoughts that are important that determines how much we receive out of this presence of God that we're going to spend time in. And part of understanding these basics of prayer is that in this world of thoughts that we're going to live in, that is where the main spiritual battle takes place that will form the present. Because the world of thoughts that we have we live in a world which has present, which has past, which has future. The past is not something you can do anything about. It's past. You can only learn to relate to the past properly. To understand how to relate to your mistakes with forgiveness and love and accept yourself as you are. To relate to your success with humility in the past and to learn from all your past. There's nothing you can do to change. You can only relate to it properly. The future is yet to be changed. The future is a place of possibility. A decision that you make right now can change your entire future to a totally different direction. Just by a simple choice made, you could determine where you're going to live, which suburb you're going to live, which place. A simple choice which job you're going to have, or which job you're going to continue in. All choices in the future to be made. And then we have the present. And the present is not static. It's changing. And what we don't realize is, in your present, there are two worlds colliding. One is the outward external world that you live in. The other is an internal world of thoughts that are existing right now. And how you respond to those thoughts is going to determine what is outwardly going to take place. Now the question is, if the world of thoughts is like wet cement, still can mold. And the world of physical reality externally is like dried cement. It's already fixed. Then we ask the question, how long does this wet cement remain wet? And how much of our thoughts in the world of thoughts that we live in, at what degree does it take place to the extent that it's no more wet, where it's become dry cement and you can't change it anymore. Because we know we all consist of visions, dreams and thoughts. And those things are passing through us and we are building around us. And as we function in this world of thoughts, because it's still wet cement, some parts of it are dropping into our lives and becoming a part of our very bone and cell and tissues. Right now as we speak, as you 
function and think upon the right thoughts. This world of thoughts is affecting every molecule in your life. Every thought you think is affecting the glands in your body. And the glands in your body, from your pituitary glands to all your other glands in your body, in different sections, are right now affecting your physical being. If your world of thoughts right now is filled with fear, filled with anxiety, filled with pain, at what point does it reach a point of no return where it's predetermined that you're going to be sick and die of a certain sickness? At what point does it become so solid in you, although it's not visible yet, but it's so solidified in you that your body is going to be sick because of a set pattern in your world of thoughts already. Solidify. And it's just a matter of time before it manifests as some sickness, some ailment. Some of the sickness may be psychosomatic caused within your body. But some sickness can be caused externally because of your mental state. Your immune system breaks down. Viruses and bacteria starts attacking your body. You become susceptible to virus and bacteria that could already be present in the body that normally would have been killed, eliminated out of your body. But because of your preconditioning, you are no more victorious over them in a micro cosmic way. And it's going to multiply until one day you find, hey, you got this pain or this sickness has manifested into this physical cancer or into some sort of sickness. At what point does it solidify? At what point can you still change it? In fact, it is not a question at what point you can change it. You can change it at any point. But it gets more difficult to change the drier the cement. The more solidified it becomes a part and parcel of you, the harder it is to change. As you know, dried cement can still be changed, except you got to knock it in back into powder. But while it's wet, you still can mold it and make it into different shapes. So we all have a world of thoughts and an external world of physical reality. This world of thoughts is where the battleground is. And every hour you think, and within the next five, six hours you spend in the presence of God, thoughts are going to run through you. And all our lives are filled with dreams, visions, and thoughts, and desire, all producing different things in our life. And that's the world that we need to understand that it affects our prayer. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, it talks about this world of thoughts that we live in, that we function in. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, Paul says um, in verse 3, 3 to 5, For though we walk in the flesh, that's your external world, Though you walk in a physical world, though you live in a world of physical flesh and reality and tangible physical dimension, we do not war according to the flesh. Another way of saying it is, although we live in a physical world, we don't try to change the physical world and try to have victory in the physical world through just the physical methods. What is a war for? A war is fought for victory. So you don't fight for victory using physical dimension. That's the key. But a lot of people try to succeed in their life purely from the physical. They forgot to do the conquest 
in a world of thoughts. So your victory is not guaranteed. And you know many people, they try and try and try. Could be the ministry, could be a business world, could be the career. They did everything they know and still fail. Or let's put it in terms of warfare. And still lose. And they tried again and tried again and keep having losses after losses. They're not winning the war. Not even winning the battles. What's wrong with their life? They, they war in the flesh. They live only in a world of physical reality and try to change your physical reality without changing the world of thoughts, which I call it the internal reality in their lives. The Bible says, we do not, see the word do not, D-O-N-O-T, do not war or live in the natural. You do live in the natural, but your real world is in the world of thoughts that you must change. So you might have failed 10 times because you have tried something in the physical and your world of thoughts was not changed. And then after on the 11th time, you realize you do not war in the flesh, but you war in the spirit. You war on the internal side. And instead of just doing something outwardly, you begin to change your world of thoughts. You begin to do battle there. And as you do battle in your world of thoughts, and you conquer in that world of thoughts, and the shape and the form of the wet cement is the shape that you wanted, the shape of victory, not the shape of defeat. And you held on to it. The enemy tries to come like, Abraham, he had put out the sacrifice and waiting for God to cut a covenant. And all the vultures tried to eat it up. So the devil, the vulture, tried to make impressions on the wet man. You defend your world of thoughts. You defend your world of thoughts. Because you have formed the right thoughts. You have formed the right shape. And there is a shape of victory. And you are holding on, holding on and letting the wet man dry. And you're holding on. And then when it's dried inside, it's formed inside. It's solidified on your inside. Still invisible to the world. But it has become a solidified pattern in you. Such that you don't even have to worry about holding a shape anymore. It's solidified. Like water. Turned into ice. Cut into a certain shape. You don't have to worry about it not standing by itself. It stands by itself. People have even used ice to build whole hotels today in places where it's cold enough for the ice to remain for a long time without melting. And in some places in the uh, 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 northern hemisphere, you might be able to visit some European town or city where when it's winter time, they have the ice hotel made of ice. Why? Because it's solid. But water cannot stand, yes, but ice can stand, can bear weight, can create things. The same way in the world of thoughts that might be liquid, is solidifying. And when it's solidified, still invisible to the world, then you live your life. You still do your best as you can. But the eleventh time, you did exactly like you did the past ten times before. But the difference is, you have now won the war in the inner world. And the eleventh time, you did exactly like what you did ten times and failed. But you did exactly the whole, whole thing with one difference. You have won the war internally. And the eleventh time, you succeed and you succeed gloriously. What's the difference? You have won the war inside. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 
verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought. See, the world of thoughts that we live in. The world of thoughts. In that world of thoughts, you bring every single thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And the thing about this world of thoughts, one part of it is still fluid. One part of it has solidified. The part that solidified, if it's wrong, you got to you got to slowly change it, renew your mind, knock down all the wrong arguments and the wrong concepts and the wrong belief system that you have accepted, knock down all the things that are against God's word that you believe wrongly. It needs to be knocked down, tear down, and form new ones in God. And unless we form new ones in God, that victory in that particular area will not be yours. So within our world of thoughts are thoughts that are still fluid that you have control over how it's going to solidify. And thoughts that are already solidified ready to be birthed into the physical world and have yet have yet to be manifest and it's going to be a big job uh, Getting real, if it, it, it's a thought of defeat. Your, your defeat is already guaranteed even before physically taking place if on your inside you're already defeated. See, the victory and, the def- and all, the, all the defeat that we have in our lives is already predetermined on your inside before you've taken one step out to do the warfare physically and have you noticed this is always a Bible pattern God always says I have given you the victory before they even went out to fight so apparently victory is something that can be given before you even fought that is why there's such a concept as Romans 8 where it says that uh, we are more than conquerors Victory is inherited before you go forth. And it's that which must change. Which is this world of thoughts that we all have. And that's what we are doing when you have an all night prayer with God. Thoughts run through you throughout the night. And sometimes it's a heavy battle. Sometimes it's an easy battle. Sometimes you worship, the enemy disappears and you form good strong thoughts. And you've got to hold that to it for some time before it solidify into your life and become a part and parcel of your life. And that's where successful prayer, unsuccessful prayer comes forth. Because within this world of thoughts are thoughts that flow from your spirit because your spirit and from the Holy Spirit and from the Spirit. There can be thoughts that flow from the Spirit of God and from your spirit. Give you a scripture for that. In the Gospel of John, Gospel of John, and we have here In John chapter, let's uh, get a right place to start. John chapter 14, verse 26. John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I say to you. Now, isn't it talking about thoughts? When you remember something, it's thoughts. 
The Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance the words of Jesus. Bring to remembrance the word of God. Bring to remembrance thoughts that are from God. John chapter 16 says in verse 13, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own, but whatever He hears, He will speak and He will tell you things to come. Those are also a flow of thoughts on your inside. So in this world of thoughts, your thoughts can arise from the Spirit. When I say Spirit, include Holy Spirit, include your spirit, man. From the spiritual dimension. Your thoughts can also arise from your soul. Whatever state or condition your soul is, is going to produce thoughts. If you have a fearful state, fearful emotions, it produces fearful thoughts. So your thoughts of anxiety, of fear, of anger, of unforgiveness, of pain, of displeasure. All these thoughts can come from your soul. Thoughts can arise. It just rises up from you because of some imperfection in your life, in your soul. In um, Jesus, as he met with his disciples, says here after his resurrection in uh, chapter 24 gospel of luke when jesus appeared to them when they were there by themselves possibly in a room luke 24 was 36 now as they said these things and there is uh, two disciples came and uh, told the other apostles what had happened. Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. And look at their reaction. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? So they have a troubled heart. Why do doubts arise in your heart? So they have all kinds of thoughts go through. Doubts. What does doubts feel like? Doubts are a series of thoughts that tell you how it's impossible for God to answer your prayer. How God's prayer is not going to be answered. How everything is not going to work out. How things are going to grow worse. How that if this is not going to happen. How all these, these are doubts. Doubts can come from our own heart and our own soul. And so one can live in that world of thoughts. You can have thoughts that come from your spirit, thoughts that come from your soul. And of course, you can have thoughts that come from the devil. That's where the enemy tries to... The Bible says that he, he has these fiery darts that you can, you can quench with a shield of faith. Fiery darts are not real fire. Fiery darts are his, his arguments, his thoughts, his temptation. His, the devil tries to throw him some, some of his fiery darts. If you have the shield of faith, very few of it got through. Unfortunately, many Christians don't even have much faith. So if the shield of faith quench your fiery darts, that's based on Ephesians chapter 6. If you have a shield of fear, it won't be a shield. It's a saying, welcome, welcome. In fact, it's actually singing the welcome song. It's just singing, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Your, your shield of fear looks more like a Chinese walk. And it's saying, Welcome, Satan. Welcome, Satan. Give me all your thoughts. You know, a shield is supposed to shield you. But your fear, no more shield, it becomes a big Chinese walk that you're saying to Satan, more, 
more, more, and he fills you with every doubt he can. Can come from the enemy. If you don't have faith, if you have little faith, then the other parts of you, which is much, would be all the thoughts of the enemy that got through. If you are half filled of faith, the other half is an open door for the enemy to throw his darts. If you have the full shield of faith, then you got zero thoughts from the enemy. You only have to deal with the thoughts that come from your spirit and your soul. Let me at least give you a scripture where the enemy's thoughts got true. In the uh, book of Acts, in the book of Acts, it says here, <coughs> in uh, chapter 5, Verse 3, Peter said to Ananias, Say, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? <coughs> what was Ananias and Sapphira plotting and thinking? <coughs> when they sold their land, they had money. Now, they wanted to give a portion to the church. They could have given a portion and said, look, this is the tithe and offering and that will be finished. But when they sold the land, they want to take credit. They want some sort of recognition. So they might have kept back part of the money and came to Peter and says, this is all that we got for the land. That's a lie. Did Ananias and Sapphira met Satan? No, they didn't. Probably didn't even see Satan. Unlike Jesus who in his temptation saw Jesus, saw Satan. But Ananias and Sapphira had this idea, this thought. And this thought tells them, hey, you don't have to give all the money. You can bluff them. It was just a thought. But by surrendering to that thought, assimilating the thought, accepting the thought, going along with the thought, the two of them agreed. And Peter recognized that thought came from Satan. They thought it was their idea. The idea came from Satan. Now Peter, how could he know it? Because he himself once upon a time was such a victim. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus had pronounced upon him the blessing. After all, he was the first to confess. The others thought about it, but didn't confess. He confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he told Jesus. And Jesus pronounced upon him a blessing. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. So in verse 17, you look at the world of thoughts that were happening. When Jesus asks of his disciples and says, Who do men say that I am? They're, of course, they start thinking. When someone asks you a question, you start thinking. Jesus asks a question, Who do men say that I am? So they start thinking, What are all that we heard people say about Jesus? So some say, John the Baptist. Some say, Elijah. Some say, Jeremiah. So they were answering as they thought they answered. Then Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And then they are all wondering, Okay, he is asking for commitment. And most of them are afraid because if they say the wrong thing, like you are a prophet, it might be you know, below what Jesus expected of them. So as they are thinking, and Peter who is usually faster with his with his mouth than he is with his heart. <laughs> he said the right thing. The thoughts must arise. He must be thinking, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. He must have thinking about it for a long time. That thought has solidified in his life. And he was fu fully convinced that Jesus is the Christ. And so Peter says, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus says, this thought that you have, I'm paraphrasing, this thought that you have that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, did not come by your own flesh. It says in verse 17, not flesh and blood reveal this to you, not your soul, but my Father in heaven give the thoughts to you. And help you to jump and come to the conclusion. So there was a reasoning taking place. His world of thoughts has solidified to the fact that he recognized Jesus as a Christ, the Son of the living God. Again, it's all thoughts. Uh, he spoke his thoughts out loud for the first time. And he had a blessing because it was a correct one. Now, having yielded to this flow of thoughts that was going on, Jesus from that day show them and say in verse 20, 20 told them not to tell anyone yet but in verse 21 from that time onwards when you cross reference some of the other disciples also start, start confessing he is the Christ the son of the living God because only in Matthew 16 it tells you Peter said it but in some of the other cross references you find uh, they say so a few of them also said that but from that time onward, Jesus showed them that the Messiah must die. He must uh, be killed, be raised the third day. Then look at verse 22. Peter now had been blessed. He had the flow of thoughts correctly. And he's been thinking, no, 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 no. He, he cannot, Jesus cannot die. He's just the Messiah. He's a Messiah. Because all his life, he's been taught the theology of the Israelite kingdom coming when the Messiah comes. They had no Israelite suffering Messiah at that time, understanding. As far as Israel looking for the Messiah, they've been looking for the Messiah since they lost their country, they lost their temple, they lost everything. And they remember that the seed of David will come and reign again, the Messiah. And so their theology was that the Messiah will come and be their king. Spiritual king and an earthly king too. So now that Jesus is the Christ, they're already excited because they thought the Christ has come to rule. Israel is going to be a great nation again. And they were concerned about that still because in the book of Acts, after Jesus went forth, they were still wondering, you know, when is the kingdom of Israel going to be restored? Their theology about the kingly Messiah was correct. But they had no room in their theology for the suffering Messiah. It conflicted with their thinking, conflicted with their understanding. And so out of that conflict of wrong theology, misapplied theology, imperfect theology, Peter was saying, you cannot, instead of accepting what Jesus said, to refine his theology, correct? Sometimes our theology needs to be upended and changed. After all, theology is man's trying to understand God. And so instead of taking what Jesus had just revealed, because revelation builds new theology. And as the new revelation came that uh, Jesus said, I'm the suffering Messiah, he should accept it and try to quantify how to add that to his, to his theology. Instead, he refused that new revelation and he tried to go against it and even had the audacity to persuade Jesus that he is wrong. And as he tried to stop Jesus, Jesus turned around and said in verse 23, Get behind me, Satan. Now, where was Satan? He was not really showing his face. Satan could be far away. He had thrown a dart into Peter's heart. Because Peter suddenly said, Cannot, cannot, we need the king. We need the Messiah. You must be king. All this anxiety, this fear that the Messiah will die, came. And he didn't know that that thought was not from God. Not even from his own soul. He might have thought that it's from himself. But it's actually from Satan. And Jesus recognized it. So I've given you all the scriptures. Thoughts can come from the Holy Spirit or the Spirit. 
Thoughts can come from your soul. Thoughts can come from the devil. Can come from the devil. Because there are more scriptures we we are given to you. We are giving to you uh, Acts 8 to show that Simon the magician, because of his life, and he was poisoned by bitterness. No one could see. He was a Christian. Born again, baptized in water. He got converted under Philip. But inside him got bitterness. And he was being poisoned by bitterness and still didn't know. You know, if he did not change, he would have died with some form of sickness caused by the bitterness. He was poisoned by bitterness. And then out of, out of that thing, it produced greed. It produced a uh, uh, sort of desire for spiritual gifts, which is a good desire. But he wanted to receive spiritual gifts by a carnal method of paying money. Because all his life he had paid money to learn his magic. Now he thought this power of the Holy Spirit, he can pay money. He said, I give you money for this power. And Peter says, your money perish with you. And told him that these things cannot be possessed with money. Wrong thinking again. Almost got him killed. And so we see that we all live in a world of thoughts. Right now, only God knows how many of your theology, how much of your thoughts and understanding are caused by your soul. Hopefully, none of them tonight are formed because of the devil infiltrating into your thinking life. But some people have the devil infiltrate into the thinking. And you say, how do you know? Because they behave like the devil. By father, like son. Jesus told the Pharisees, you're like the, you're the devil. Say, then they say, how can we, why do you say we're the devil? He say, your father is a murderer. <laughs> the devil is a murderer, so are you. Because they were trying to kill him. Remember this, there are a lot of Christians, and I say it boldly, because this is true. One day, when everyone gets back to heaven, they look back into this life, your life is analyzed and put under a microscope. You will find every time, whether it be Christian or non-Christian, people do things that destroy. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It's the devil behind it. So how do we know? When the devil was locked up for a thousand years, there was no more problem. So you can imagine out in this present the external world that we live in, how much of the devil's thought has been assimilated by people. And the last group of people who expect it to be assimilated is by the Christians. But Christians have been, gu- have been guilty. In Christian history, in the past 2,000 years, there have been much of Christian history where Christians themselves are guilty of killing. The Inquisition period. A lot of innocent people die. And during the time of the papacy, a lot of tremendous wrong things done. They try to kill anyone who, have, who reads the Bible. Try to kill anyone who believes you can be justified by faith alone. Burn them at the stake. People who do good things. Joan or Ark. She did all the, the thing to deliver. She was... She was Killed. Not by non-Christians, by Christians. Because they tried her and burned her as a witch. Because today, they don't see her as a witch anymore. Every Christian, whether in history or present, who action show forth that you still kill and destroy, those thoughts came from Satan. They became a part of your life. We pray tonight that we understand that this world of thoughts that we live in. Now, how many of us are like Jesus 100% right now? None of us can say that. Which means that within each one of us, in this world of thoughts that we have, which is the next physical reality, See, we live in these two worlds. There's an external world 
of physical reality, and you have an internal world of thoughts. Now, this internal world of thoughts is producing your physical reality. It's fluid changing in the solid. And that's the world you can control. What has already been solidified out in the natural world, you got to change it with the new future, changing the present. And there are parts within each one of us where thoughts have solidified that might not be perfectly solidified in God. Concepts, belief systems, methodologies, things within us. And we have not been challenged by this word, challenged by the light of Jesus Christ, challenged by the perfection of Jesus, who is the ultimate measuring ruler for every thought and desire and dream and vision we have then that part of us, unless it is changed, must be crushed when it's wrong, removed if it's wrong, corrected if it's wrong. And that part that is still forming must be formed correctly to give the right mold to form the next change. And that is what is taking place in an all-night prayer. That's what's taking place every day in your life. Every day, you're in that world of thoughts. And we need to know that each time you speak a word, each time you express yourself, each time you pray a prayer, it is flowing from your world of thoughts. Sometimes it flows from the Spirit, and spirit to spirit cry out to God and you got the results. God hears that world of thoughts. God hears it. Let me just point to some prayers in the Bible. In the book of First Samuel, there is this prayer by Hannah in chapter 2 of First Samuel. Uh, uh, that is her worship and thanksgiving. Let's look at chapter 1. It says in chapter 1, verse 10, She was in bitterness of soul. I mean, this poor woman had been suffering such pain. And probably, if, you know, she's, um, she would be in that place. You know, some people, they thought that, why their life has no victory, no victory, no victory. I want you to know the good news. If you are Abraham's seed, we have talked about Abraham's blessings before, it is your right to have victory, to be blessed like Father Abraham. If as a believer and if in Christ, you have not got a taste of some success, I didn't say overnight it will take place, but through time and predetermination, if your world of thoughts change, your outward world will change. Change your world of thoughts, your outward world will change. Retain the wrong thing in your world of thoughts, your outward world will be a disaster. We do not war outwardly. Now by all means, outwardly keep faithful to the anything that you're doing that is good. But if you want any changes, it's your internal world of thoughts that must change. First. And then solidify until you become a part and parcel of your character. A thought that is constantly meditated, assimilated, become part of your principle, life principle and belief system, becomes a pattern of thinking. And the pattern of thinking becomes a subconscious pattern where instead of you trying to think those thoughts, those thoughts now influence you. And then after some time, when it becomes a pattern of thinking, it becomes part of your character. When it sinks into your, at first it's your conscious thoughts, then when it sinks into your subconscious, it becomes your part of your character. Because it's subconscious. It's indirectly influencing you now. And after some time, when it becomes your character, you will act out according to your character. So within each one of us, 
are things to be transformed, things to be changed. And you always say, Lord, change me. Lord, transform me. And we all expect that as we come before God, you know, we are like a piece of metal and God is a fire and you bring before the fire and, and then, and then from, from black, you know, you glow into orangey. Ah, and then you're transformed. In the spiritual realm, it does take place that way. But when you break down the process, how it takes place, is God transforming your world of thoughts first. As you come near to God, your thoughts are challenged. Especially thoughts that are not in line with the, with the thoughts of God. Thoughts that are not properly, the concept are incorrect or inaccurate. They're challenged so that you're willing. And when you're challenged, you've got two responses. Either you reject or you accept. So when you reject, people can react differently. When, when, when charis, non-charismatics and evangelicals are presented with the baptism in the Spirit. And I used to be an evangelical who was not baptized in the Spirit. I didn't accept it yet. I only got filled with the Spirit while I was in the seminary. But before I went to the seminary, I was in a Baptist church. And in that Baptist church, we didn't have the baptism in the Spirit, nor speaking in tongues. The first time I hear people speaking in tongues, before I went to the seminary, I always say, the devil. Yes, my theology had no place for it. And not only that, you get upset at this type of people. Why you get upset? They have nothing to do with your life. Because when you reject, you have to be angry so it makes you feel good. Because when you're angry, you're putting the blame of the rejection on the other side, not on you. See, anger is always turned outwards. Anger is blame turned outwards. Because it's not my fault, it's your fault. Come. Anger is not accepting blame. And Hannah, in his bitterness of soul, prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Now, remember she had done that year after year after year, but no results. Because most of the time, I can assure you, all her cry came from her soul. I believe this particular year when she went there, her world of thoughts changed. And I want you to know, if you come for all night prayer, and you came like Hannah did, and how many years? Well, in verse 7 it says, So it was, year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. So every year she was provoked. Every year she cried until her husband cannot stand it. The husband said, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grief? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Wow. But you know, Hannah will say, no, no, not at all. <laughs> she still wept and she cried. You can go to God in prayer. You can fast and pray 40 days. You can come for every all night prayer. But your world of thoughts must be challenged and must change. Tomorrow morning, when you walk out of this place after 6 a.m., you must have your world of thoughts change a little bit more. Sometimes it's changed a lot more because you're challenged totally. Because some things challenge us. When I talk about the spiritual world and heaven and you know, the people, because <sighs> sometimes people need to be challenged. And let me tell you, whatever I wrote in the book is only a small percentage. Say, so why? People are not ready. People are not ready. But if you're ready, remember, if what you believe is in line with the word and in line with true reality, it transforms you. But whatever parts of you that are, that are belief system that are not in line with truth, 
in the Word of God and true reality, that's the part that's working against you. Against you. Because only the truth sets you free. The opposite of the truth of truth sets you free is the lie puts you in bondage. Correct? And every lie that we believe, well, some of you, so you say, oh, so innocent, never lied before. Ah, but you could lie to yourself. When you say God caused all your problems, that's a lie. You might have believed it. When you thought that God was against you, that's a lie. Because our Father is not like that. And when you thought maybe like uh, 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 in your life you could thought of, oh no, some, some, some people have witchcraft on you. That could be a lie because every witchcraft will bounce off you if there's nothing in you that lets it get into you. You are defeated by your own thoughts and nobody else. Don't blame anyone. When something bad happens to you, it is the person that you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, that's the guy to blame. Don't pass it on to somebody else. Your success or your failure in your Christian life, in your ministry life, in your business life, in your working life, is your responsibility and only yours. I acknowledge circumstances, people, Things around you can make it easier or harder for you. But if you are determined and you know what is rightfully yours, even the lowest pauper can be a king. Even the least talented can be wise. Because it's all in your own world of thoughts that must change. And it's this world of thoughts that we must change and confront. And, and God is merciful. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't do all at once because He knows how uncomfortable we feel to change. We are all creatures of habit. We don't like to change. Like some of... Like, well, better illustrate with something else, but... Let's say, you know, have you seen some people who have a makeover? Right? All your life you could be a grubby dresser. Now, I didn't say you have to waste a lot of money. You don't need to spend that much money to at least dress decently, correct? We all could have come to all night prayer in our flip flops. We all could have come for all, all night prayer. Some of you ladies could have come for all night prayer with colors in your hair still. Right? We could have. But you present yourself well. But some of us are in a habit of, of certain way of dressing and certain style that could actually be sloppy. But because we accept sloppiness as part of our life, so we don't mind. And although we say, well, that's not important. Well, now with the Lord Jesus in your life, it might be important. If you could wear a red shirt and convert another 10 people, wear a red shirt. And believe me, we all possibly can look in our wardrobe today and get rid of probably 50% of those things. Because some of those things, you know, like for me, I'm one of those very unwilling to get rid of things. Especially, I must wear until there's a hole in it. And so, you know, uh, sometimes they say, hey, hey, it's, you just got to get rid of it. Like, How long has this shirt been? Since 15 years ago. Still that. Say, but it's good. Okay, wear it. By all means. But perhaps, perhaps, something might need to change. That's just a very rough illustration, right? And I'm not advocating that, you know, what everyone, oh, come to church, wow, three-piece suit. Oh, no, no, no. Just, just, just be yourself, be casual, just, you know, uh, dress, you know, reasonably. That's okay. And, um, and the thing about it is, in a church where there is no rules, which we don't have a rule to say you go to wear this and that, you know, how do you implement a certain thing? Well, subconsciously. Right? 
if the pastor dressed sloppy, uh, come to preach with the hair not combed, you know, come in slippers, and, uh, and then uh, in uh, Bermuda shorts, and uh, preach in a t-shirt, you know, and not just any on the nice looking t-shirts, but the t-shirts that the uh, Kuaitiao seller uh, would use, you know, he would roll it above his big tummy, and a low cut t-shirt, with white color things and then you say, Whoa, you know, and of course if you got miracle signs and wonders, people say, Never mind, never mind. But is it that never mind to Jesus? To a certain extent, I mean you do have a choice. And so we dress reasonably. Right? You don't go over the top until you know, well, you don't want a church where everyone has to spend a lot of money on clothing and then they go, Oh so oh they're all well well dressed, but they all got nothing to eat. All the time and always in debt. That's terrible. But that's just a simple illustration of of things we are used to and we don't change. You know the strange thing in the spiritual world when you go into the spiritual world, you see people of, of who you know people who are in, in the heavenly place heavenly place or spiritual world, uh, not those in hell, in the heavenly places, you, you go there, you see people who have lived uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, 4,000 years ago, or uh, 300 years ago, guess what? Up there, their style is still the same like the time they live it. Because they're so used to that style mentally, when in heaven, there is nothing that is short, nothing that you have to buy. So guess what? For example, if you all go to heaven, let me ask a question, okay? Let's say, if Eric goes to heaven, Eric, will you be wearing a robe? <laughs> He's laughing. Because, you know, we might not be sure whether you're going to wear a robe or would you have like, you know, to, to wear something that looks like at least a pants or something. Because we mentally adjust to it. When in heaven, your clothes could be created by your thoughts. But their thoughts still create the old clothes of their own fashion. Strange. How much our thoughts solidify and became part of it. So for year after year, there was no success at all for Hannah until internally for the first time her thoughts changed. And this time the thoughts are coming. Her prayer is now coming from her spirit. Before her prayer is coming from her soul. This is her soul still expressing, but there's a spirit part coming out. Because in verse 11, she made a vow. And she said, O oh Lord of hosts. And then she dedicate the child to God that she doesn't have. This is a, this is a spiritual prayer now. No more just a bitterness cry. So the prayer came from her spirit. And it started transforming her. Her internal world of thoughts was changing. Instead of looking inside, she starts looking outside. Now, when she starts dedicating a child she never had to the Lord, her faith was now rising. Before that, she could be saying, I want a child, 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 right? All the time. Now she says, Lord, I give you. You give me a child, I'll give this child back to you. Her life turned around. She not only had one child, she had many other children after that. She truly had success in her own way. And look at the Gospel, uh, gospel of Luke chapter 18. There are two people went up to pray. And when you see these two prayers that are going on in Luke chapter 18, and Jesus tells this story. You look, Gospel of Luke chapter 18, the parable of the these two. Two men they went out to pray. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed. This is how the Pharisee prayed. Pharisee prayed. God, I thank you. I'm not like the other man. 
extortionists, unjust, adulterers, even a this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And so he got telling of all that he has done, all those things. None of his prayer came from his spirit. Everything was his soul. He was a proud, greedy person. Jesus says the Pharisees are concerned with all the outward things. They are, they are covetous. They were greedy for money. And they were in it for reputation. They will make long ropes, uh, their ropes long. They pray long prayers so people think they are very spiritual. All these things, it look outwardly like spiritual. Everything in their world of thoughts and prayer was from their soul. It was all out of pride and attention. Nothing was spiritual. Because you cannot get through God. God is a spirit. So that is his world of thought. His world of thoughts is about himself. Not about God. His world of thoughts surround all the things of himself. How great he is. right? How spiritual he was. You know, how he fasts twice a week. Give tithes of all he possesses. All the things. And then he says, he's not like these other people. He's better than them. These are all his pride. Prideful thoughts coming up. Nothing. No results. But this publican, or this tax collector next to him, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, the publican, or the tax collector, was convicted of his own sin. And he rec- the, the text character recognized, I'm a sinful person. Oh God. Now, who do you think is convicting him of sin? God. And he's responding to the conviction of God. And it, his prayer came from his spirit. He was feeling in his spirit the conviction of God. And he was expressing the conviction. God heard his prayer. So as we enter into prayer tonight, we need to discern our world of thoughts. Thoughts will flow through you tonight. And of course we pray none of the devil kind. But if the devil had already established a wrong pattern of thinking in your life, God may be convicting you tonight as you pray. Because that thought that has been solidified that could be causing some actions and could cause more future actions, the Holy Spirit tonight will be knocking it down. And so that the devil will have no place in you. Or, your own soul thoughts, that could came out of your bitterness, out of your pain, out of your suffering, out of your past, out of things that you have suffered from other people, out of your upbringing, out of the wrong teaching you got in your life, out of the wrong conclusions you have made in your life, out of the life principles that are wrongly uh, configured in your life. All those could also be flowing. And the Holy Spirit will be seeking to change them. Unless He changed the world of thoughts, He cannot change your reality. Of course, tonight, the Spirit also can flow with His thoughts and new thoughts to you. That you might have to assimilate. He could be strengthening things that He has spoken to you. He could be telling you things. Inspiring things in your life. Adding to what He has told you before. To solidify the liquid thoughts that are still flowing within you. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12. It says here, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So tonight as you pray, God's word will speak. The Holy Spirit will speak, remind you of the words of God. And as those words come, 
it will help you to discern. God's thoughts will be rising in you. Your own soul will have thoughts. And anything that the devil has built into your life, the devil is not around tonight, but what he's built into your life may cause flows of certain thoughts. And it's for you to wrestle through in your world of thoughts tonight. And when you pick the right thoughts that flow, hold on to it and meditate in it as you pray. So some of the basics that we got to understand what is happening in prayer is this world of thoughts that's taking place. And we need to allow the discerning to take place. Why is this purpose? It's so that you and I can enter into the place of a rest. See, the purpose of verse 12 is verse 11. Verse 11 says, to enter the rest. Remember what I say, we do not war in the flesh. When this world of thoughts is correctly constructed, guess what takes place? The natural reality will follow easily. There will be no struggle for success because you already have the success. There's no struggle for victory. You already have the victory. There's no struggle for provision because you already got the provision. There's no struggle for healing. You already have a healthy thoughts. That produce healing. So it's a rest that you enter into. Your victory is in this world of thoughts as form. And there's a liquid part and a solidified part. And as you pray, it's forming and solidifying more and more. Sometimes it comes as a vision. And you're supposed to keep seeing and seeing and seeing what the Lord shows you. Until it becomes a reality in your life. Solidify. Sometimes it could be a sense of a, of a flow where God shows you things and you're thinking through them as you pray. So this world of thoughts that we all are surrounded is your future. It's your near future and your ultimate future. And as you enter into this prayer, there is the Holy Spirit and there is this world of thoughts that you are doing warfare in. And you should wrestle through in it. And you fight the good fight of faith. You enter the rest. You don't have to work, but you walk in the works. Everything will flow once you win the battle of the thoughts. So let's all rise together as we prepare ourselves to enter into prayer and each one of us internally has this bubble of thoughts that is in this atmosphere of the Spirit of God for you to transform your mind transform your, your being and as you surrender yourself to the Lord the Lord is able to transform you